Hello, everybody, and welcome to Generation 180's Ask an EV Owner. My name is Stuart Gardner, and I'm one of this evening's hosts. Uh, we've assembled a great panel of EV owners to answer your questions. Before we introduce you, just want to tell you a little bit about Generation 180. We're a nationwide nonprofit organization working to inspire and equip individuals to take action on clean energy. One of our key programs is the Electrify Your Ride campaign and the I'm Going Electric Pledge. Our goal is to make electric vehicles more accessible through EV, EV owner advocates and interactive events like this one. You can find out more about us by visiting generation180.org. And while you're there, make sure and sign this pledge and tell us about it. Without further delay, our co-host Blair St. Ledger Olson will tell us a little bit about our panel and share some ground rules. Blair? Thanks, Stuart. Hi, everybody. Uh, like Stuart said, my name's Blair. I'm joining you guys from Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm a program manager with Generation 180. Some do's and don'ts just before we get started. Due to the number of people on this panel, we are not going to unmute you or let you share your video. That would just be too much reverberation of sound. So instead, what we'd like you all to do is use the Q&A, not the chat, specifically the Q&A, uh, to submit your questions, if you didn't already submit your questions. We had about 20 questions submitted in advance um, that we're going to try and pepper throughout as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And more importantly, because you're not here to listen to me, uh, you're here to listen to all these fabulous panelists. Um, and these are some of our fantastic EV ambassadors from not just here in Virginia, but also from around the country. So uh, just based on who is in the order of my Brady Bunch Zoom box, uh, I'm going to let David start things off. Hey, I'm David Moody. I'm also from Charlottesville, and I am the owner of the um, Kia Nero EV that I bought last October. And I'm looking very much forward to sharing my experience with it. Awesome. Abed, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm Abed Safi. I, uh, I live up in Seattle, so far away from all of you um, in Charlottesville. And uh, uh, I have a Nissan Leaf. Uh, 2015 LEAF, so we've been electric for a good amount of time now. So happy to share uh, my experiences there too. Awesome. Miriam? I'm Miriam Rajai. I live in Chevy Chase, Maryland, although I did live in Virginia for a long time. And I own a Tesla Model X that I purchased in 2019. All right, Brad, bring us home. Hi, everyone. Um, Brad Campbell. I, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia as well. Um, about two years ago now, I bought my uh, 2018 Chevy Bolt. So I've been uh, all electric since then, and of course, happy to talk about it. Well, thank you guys all for spending your Thursday evenings with us. I know our Thursday evenings are, you know, as busy these days with COVID, but that doesn't mean we can't still talk about EVs, share our experiences, and hopefully, you know, ask, ask some pertinent questions. So Stuart, do you want to kick us off with our first question? Yeah, let's, let's start with a, a softball. Um, some of you guys are newer owners, some are, are, have had them for a little while. What did your friends and family say uh, when you told them or when they saw you pulling up in an electric vehicle? Um, Brad, you wanna go first? Um, sure, I mean, I, I don't think they really knew what to, to make of it. Um, uh, I, I definitely remember, I can't remember if it was from, from my grandma or somebody, uh, asking, um, you know, just kind of like, where's the engine? Um, but it, it's great because I, I just like to, to talk about it and explain. Um, my, a lot of my family lives in Michigan uh, and I'm in Virginia. So I, I do that trip pretty frequently, uh, a couple, at least a couple times a year. Uh, well, normally. And, and so I, I, I like to you know, talk about how the trip went and how it's like not really a big deal. I don't do much planning. I, I just start driving. So um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of nice at introducing people to it. Awesome. Miriam, you want to go next? Me? Sure. Talking about answering the same question. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna let all of y'all share uh, that same perspective. So I think the perspective from my family is I've always driven a luxury car. Like always had a, either a BMW or a Mercedes in our family. And I went from a BMW X5 to the Model X. So some of my family was like, what in the world are you doing? Because you don't have the power or, you know, what are you doing? They 
really confused, but you do have power, you do have the speed, you do have the kick, and it's all electric and it's great for the environment. So I just could give them, you know, let them test drive it, driven with me. So they've been more than pleased. Awesome. David? Um, they've been kind of distantly curious <laughs> about it. Um, so I've had to kind of uh, shovel my enthusiasm onto them, but. Uh, um, one of my daughters is in, in the transportation arena, so she was already pretty familiar with some of the basic concepts, um, and others have been generally supportive and enthusiastic. Um, I was real impressed when I did a similar kind of educational video some time back that my father happened to watch, and he was impressed and interested in my car as a result of just what I had to say, and he had known nothing about electric cars. That's great. Well, I can I can attest to the uh, slowly chipping away at your family. Sorry, Dad, if you're on this. Um, you know, slowly changing family perspectives on EVs uh, is definitely a shared experience of mine. Um, so I, I hear that, David. Uh, awesome answers, everybody. One more, Blair Abbott. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I, I'm oh, that's so okay. Done. I'm just no worries. Out no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I mean, it was, it's definitely a family affair, you know, buying a car. So my, I've kind of always been wanting to go there. We had a, I had a Prius in like 1999 or 2000 or whatever. So sort of uh, in spite of that, I got, I, I managed to get, find, a, find someone to marry me. So, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, funny looking cars and whatnot. So uh, I had to convince my wife, you know, primarily. And, and so it was just kind of the, the test drive and, you know, getting comfortable with it. And, and um, I think just getting in the car and driving it uh, kind of brought her around. And um, my father-in-law, another, another story. I mean, he's just very against anything new uh, and different. So I think we'll just let that one be one of those things that we're going to agree to disagree about. And maybe you'll come around, you know, in 10 years when you can't really buy anything else. So. <laughs> Very true. Ah, family. I, I'm going to get an earful from my father if he's on this later. Um, and there's the thunder. Uh, so on this subject, first question um, that someone has put in our Q and A, was it hard to find the model that fit your needs? Uh, David, do you mind taking that one? Sure. Um, no, not really. I mean, there's such a variety available, so that's good. I mean, I, had, I was initially certainly intrigued by all the tech with Teslas. Uh, and when the Model 3 came out, that was sort of the height of my interest. But then I realized that I had been spoiled by driving hatchback vehicles for quite some time. And the lack of a hatchback and the utility from that was a big factor for me uh, in picking the Nero because it is a hatchback in that way. It has lots of space. All right, that's, that's good. That, and that kind of goes along to another question um, from the <laughs> participants. Um, and this is for each one of you. What was the most important thing kind of in retrospect that you evaluated uh, in your shopping journey? You know, what were those things that you say, oh, if I'm gonna do electric, I want to have this. Um, can you give us some insight on the, the things you evaluated? I'm happy to take that one and kind yeah. of back off of what David said. So I was really adamant with my line of work. I sell real estate that I you know, do transport supplies to homes for staging or you know, big mirrors. I always thought the whole concept of an EV car was a tiny little small car that has no room. And uh, when I started looking at cars and seeing how much space my car now has, the Model X, with, um, I did not put in a third row. So the back space and the trunk space, I can fit a whole curo cabinet in there, an end table, coffee tables. I've even taken chase lounges um, and transported them into homes. So that was huge for me, the amount of space, because that's what I had in my original, um, in my previous cars, in the SUVs that I've driven. Yeah, so space. Mm -hmm. um, what about you, Abed? What were some of those things that were, were most important to you when shopping? Well, I mean, we had two cars. So, you know, we were, one car is sort of the family car, road trip car, ski car. 
Um, the other car is the kind of commute car. So, you know, we, we had, we replaced the commute car. And so, you know, it was just a question of how far do we need to go every day? And um, it was Seattle, the distances are, you know, relatively short, right? 10 miles is, is uh, kind of the distance from home to work. So um, a leaf fit that bill just fine and uh, it's very affordable, really. I mean, um, so, and then you don't pay anything for gas. So, I mean, the cost of ownership was, 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 was really good. And, uh, and I kind of been just sitting on it for a while, waiting and waiting and waiting for more models. And I just, you know, I decided stop waiting, just do it. Um, that was 2015. So, um, so that's, that's worked great. And, you know, what I would also add is that, uh, you know, people tend to overthink how much you really need in terms of how far do you really drive every day? I mean, you just, it's, it's more than adequate, right. For what we're doing. And then we have another car to be able to take road trips and whatnot. So, um, that works just fine for us. I think the, the last statistic I saw is, you know, before COVID, the average commute uh, to work, you know, is 26 miles or not more than 26 miles. So really, um, you know, a vehicle with that range is, is, is very adequate. Um, yeah. And to your point, you know, waiting for more models, we now have over 40 models of EVs on the road. And that's something we work to help people know about is there are more than three there's, you know, there's actually yeah. quite, quite a few. Yeah. Brad, what about you? What did you, uh, what did you consider there? Um, so when I bought my Bolt, I was living in an apartment that did not have any charging um, at the apartment complex. Um, so I was looking for something where with enough miles of range that um, I, I wasn't sort of always kind of worried about having to charge it. Um, for sort of like in-city use and then also or I could uh, drive for a couple hours before having to stop on a road trip um, and the bolt that rated 238 miles I mean really fit that and then I think the other element was price um, so at about the you know mid third mid to upper 30s MSRP um, price that was pretty uh, reasonable very competitive um, in 2018. Right. David, before, you want to round us out? Ooh, good point. Uh, I remember when I was initially shopping, I was actually having range anxiety at that point and have come to realize, my, you know, my car has a pretty significant range of about 250 miles. And I realized that unless I do a road trip, that's really a lot of overkill. Uh, as Abid said, you know, I might only charge at home once or twice a week. That's when I was commuting to work. <clears throat> um, but it's, it's also nice to know that I have that range if I do need or want to go on a road trip in the car. Yeah. Uh, well, you guys bring up a really good point, charging range. Um, and Mary, I'm going to kick this question to you first. And then Brad, I'd love your perspective, especially as a, a, form, a former apartment uh, tenant. So what kind of charger uh, have you guys, if any, installed at home? Uh, and did you need to make alterations to your home's electric supply to accommodate it? And this question was sent to us in advance. Uh, so if you don't see it in the Q&A, that is why. Uh, Mary, you want to start? Absolutely. So um, I have a standard 220 in my garage, but I this house, when we left Virginia and moved, I knew that the, my Model X was coming. So I, position, I got to a position where I wanted to have it in the garage because it's a two car garage. So I wanted it to be near where the charger was. So I was not wrapping the cord around trying to access the, the and get the plug in correctly. So I got to position it and it's, it, I did not have to make any modifications because the panel was being, the house was being built. So that was absolutely fine. But I've helped other people put chargers in their home. And a, two to, a misconception is a 220 is just like this weird charger. And it's not. It's what your washer and dryer normally take. So when you explain that and just break it down for people, it's, it's attainable. It's not so far-fetched to put one in your garage or in a, in a, if you have some outdoor space that you could have it covered. And, and plug your car in if you don't have a garage or maybe a carport per se. Absolutely. Brad, you want to touch upon that one? 
Sure. So when I lived in an apartment, like I said, no charging there, I would, I would sort of charge opportunistically, but with you know, over 200 miles and a relatively short commute, I was charging once every week or every other week. Um, so that was pretty manageable. Um, since then, I've moved into a house um, which conveniently had a, a 240 volt outlet in the garage. Um, so now I have a, a juice box um, uh, J1772 charger. Um, yeah, super, super easy, super nice to just park in your garage, plug your car in, done. Instead of having to go to the gas station, or if you're like me, waking up every morning to go to work pre-COVID, being shoot, I am almost out of gas. <laughs> every morning again if my dad thought i'm sorry you raised me better i'm gonna get such an earful <laughs> brad, brad i'd love to hear some follow-up you mentioned in the, i think the introduction about um driving to michigan periodically mm -hmm. and um anyone else that has some long distance stories we got a couple questions in the q a about kind of um you know planning for trips or availability of chargers how do you how do you manage that how does that how does that work for you when you take a longer trip beyond, um, you know, just commuting to work? Um, Brad, you want to start? And then if anyone else has something to add? Sure. So, I mean, this, there's definitely a split uh, sort of Tesla versus not Tesla at the moment. Um, so speaking from sort of the not Tesla um, side, there's um, several apps that, that make this pretty easy. Basically you put in your start and your, your end and what car you have and it sort of tells you um, what are some reasonable stops? Um, the, in most areas, the charging network in the last, I would say really it's the last year, it's gotten pretty good. So where it's, it's generally not too difficult. Uh, it does mean that I sort of have to take the route. Like I can't just choose any old roads. I do have to sort of follow where the, where the chargers are kind of the major roads in the, in the major areas. Um, but but uh, yeah, I mean, overall, it's, uh, uh, it's gotten, again, it's gotten a lot easier <laughs> uh, as the more chargers have appeared. But, um, and, then, and then it takes, it's, it's kind of like anything, it takes a little bit of practice. So I, I sort of have a feel um, uh, of what I'm sort of comfortable with, how much to charge at each, each location. Um, if I don't want to just trust the, the app. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's, I, find it to be fun but it's it's been it's it's not it's not too difficult okay all right anyone else have experience taking their uh electric vehicle on a longer trip i do um i guess i'm the tesla version when you map out your course it gives you it's so simple it calculates out your route and tells you where you need to stop at the tesla supercharged stations and most of them are located centrally to something to grab a bite to eat use the restroom um, have some coffee and then the car does supercharging and then you just get back on the route. So my in-laws live in Pittsburgh, for instance, it routes it for you. And again, like Brad said, you learn along the way that maybe, you know, I don't want to stop here. I do want to stop there. I'm gauging it this way. And then also if you're using the air conditioning <laughs> and driving the car, the miles are not the same because you're in the air conditioning and you're using everything in the car. So you have to gauge for that. And I've got two teenagers that are constantly pushing buttons and it's too hot back here and this and that. So you have to plan, but it's, again, the stops are good. They're a good location. So you can always, you know, refresh, get pizza, get coffee. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many of us have our favorite gas stations? Like, yeah. we, we, we all do. <laughs> Does anybody else I mean, to that one? I'll just, I'll just add. I mean, let's not be unrealistic. Like, you're not really going to road trip in a Leaf, a, a 2015 Leaf. I mean, I've done it. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm not road tripping far. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's 80 to 100 miles of range. Like, yeah. I mean, it's fun because you get to plan it out. Like, I used to fly planes. So it's like, okay, and it's kind of like, okay, I've got my flight plan. I've got my <laughs> checkpoints. I've got my bailout charging. You know, I've got my course and speed. I can optimize. I'm, I'm nerding out, you know, and the kids will sort of, you know, go along with it. Everybody humors me, but, you know, I'd say, you know, uh, you know, your, your one charge kind of make sure you can get home, but I'm not, I'm not doing much, uh, distance road tripping unless I'm really planning a lot of time to stop, um, along the way. So, um, 
I would say if you wrote, you know, if this is your only car, I think it changes how you think about it. We have two cars. Yeah. If it's your only car, then, you know, you'll want, you want more range for the road trip if that's something important to you. Yeah. And then the Tesla is, is easier because of the charging network. So those are kind of the considerations on road tripping. Yeah, it's probably but, but, a use, to say but a used the, leaf is ten ten thousand bucks. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like there is that. <laughs> I mean, it's like okay, buy two of them, you know, and whatever. Buy one, and I don't know. It's I've thought about it actually. Just get another one. It's worth saying too. I think that the charging infrastructure for non-Tesla cars is evolving, mm -hmm. uh, and it's grown a lot. And uh, there's a whole system called Electrify America that was part of Volkswagen settlement for Dieselgate that has been establishing um, a system that's becoming comparable to Tesla supercharger network in many ways. Uh, so it's, it's just, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing how it's gonna be just even in the future. Yeah, and I'm noticing yeah more and more too as if i can chime in i'm noticing it like in apartment complexes and shopping plaza mm -hmm. the beautification project with boston i'm noticing it's not just that there in fact there is no tesla charging stations there it's just all it's electrical charging stations they're making that part of the new rebuild because they're saying that there's a need for it and people want it so i'm seeing it in dc yeah. and in arlington area expanding yeah. Yeah, I took a look at Plugstar. Um, that's one of the, for those of you listening, that is one of the apps um, or web platforms that you can look at maps on and was looking at a route for someone who had emailed asking about how to get from Northern Virginia to, to New York, um, to, to Long Island. And I was like, look at all these chargers just right up 95. Uh, so there really are lots and lots and lots of chargers. And I mean, to, to Miriam's point, we're starting to see them more and more as well. Um, so I think that helps change the dynamic of, oh, there are no chargers. It's, no, no, there are. You're just not seeing them quite yet. And they're starting to get here more. Um, and there's lots of companies like Electrify America who are helping build out that infrastructure. So speaking of charging, um, getting away from charging on long distances and coming back to charging at home, I'm curious, um, and David, maybe we'll start with you, as to what the impact on your monthly bill has been. Uh, and then I don't know if any of you actually uh, are residential solar owners as well, or if you uh, have anything to add on tr driving on sunshine as someone has asked. Um, sure, I've, I've kind of looked at the electric company's website about my usage to try to look at that. And uh, between only having my car since October and COVID, uh, it's been very hard to find any difference. But in those months between October and March, I didn't really notice an appreciable difference. Uh, and the other way to look at that is that, you know, if I put 20 kilowatts, 20 kilowatt hours of energy into my battery, uh, that's 20 times 11 cents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's two something dollars worth of electricity. So that's pretty negligible. Yeah. For sure. Does anybody else have anything to add on that one? Um, I, I could just say that uh, what's nice about the juice box, for example, is it does have an app and it tracks how much energy <laughs> has been delivered through it. Um, so I looked, so I, I actually got it in January. I've used 630 kilowatt hours um which so you could multiply that out by um, your electric rate mine it ends up being about 90 dollars um uh and that's it's a little bit difficult to know exactly how many miles that is it's uh because some of those has been on the public chargers um still that's nothing compared to gasoline uh huh? yeah it, it's it's definitely cheaper than gasoline well, I don't think we have any uh, residential solar owners on here, but I can at least uh, speak. And if you are a residential solar owner on the call, throw, throw, throw your thoughts in the chat. Um, but I've, everything I've heard from our ambassadors is that they absolutely love charging their car on solar. Even if your, uh, your state's energy mix is not where you would like it to be, driving an EV is environmentally better 
then driving at a gas car across the country. Um, that's that's been the case for about two to three years now. So really, it doesn't matter what your energy mix is. Uh, it's better, but it's even better if you're directly charging on from the solar on your roof. So that's for sure. I've had my house looked at to get the solar estimate for the solar panels. My husband freaked out, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was good to get. And it was good to know that with that, we could, you know, kind of take care of our entire household and charge my car, but he's not ready to commit to that quite yet. <laughs> Change takes time. <laughs> I got the electric car, that, that baby steps. The Here's an interesting question. Have any of you, um, and I think if you have a second car, maybe it doesn't apply as much, but have any of you driven a traditional powertrain gas car since getting your electric vehicle? And what was it like when you got back into that gas car? What was that like? <laughs> You want to start, David? I think you said it all, but uh... well, it's just it's noisier and it's it's not smooth. You know, driving my car is just velvety smooth, and that's mm. not the case in a in an ICE car, internal combustion engine car. Uh, it's just kind of noisier and clunkier. The the acceleration is not as smooth across all the speeds as you go up faster. It's just not the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's definitely not the same <laughs> um yeah so i have had to drive my son's car after a really long practice and he was just really tired so i met him around the corner actually we, we would live in a walkable neighborhood so he came to join us at dinner and i <laughs> drove his car back and he has a um, gently used jeep <laughs> and gently. with like, stop driving it just stops so like i got out of the car and i hear this like humming sound of my husband's like the car is still on thank god <laughs> i don't know it was just it seems so weird because with my car it's like one pedal driving in his car it felt like i was like learning how to drive for the first time <laughs> how about you brad yeah, I agree. Um, the first the first time after it had been, been a while, and then I, I had to rent a car for something. And I remember I, I was headed towards a red light. And I'm, there was that moment where I'm like, why is why am I not stopping? Why is why am I running going right towards this red light? <laughs> oh, right. This car doesn't do the one pedal driving. I actually have to move my foot and slow down. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, that's right. Okay, remember how to do that. Um, you just get so used to it. It's so seamless. And then, and then the rest of the, the, that trip, I was just like, it's just like, wait, why, where's all this noise coming from? Like David was saying, and it's like, we're stopped. Why are you still running? Like, what, what am I spending this money? I want to put, put, fuel this back up when I'm done. Like, we're just, we're not moving. You don't need to run. Uh, yeah, very, very weird. And I'm like, and then I get home and I'm like, oh, this is so much better. <laughs> and and Abed, having, having two car family, I assume your other car is, uh, is gas, do you guys fight about who gets the quiet car? Oh, my wife just took the this electric car. So, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm, Good man. there's no, I mean, I just, you know, I just give up and let it go. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, she did not, she, let me just put it this way. She was not asking to take the Prius. You know, like she's yeah. she wasn't like, oh, I want that car. Right, right. Fine. So that that's your deal. You like the eco stuff. Good for you. Blah blah blah. Okay, I want you know this, you know, other car that's bigger, more room and stuff. And then, and since then, now that was a car I bought for her, or she bought. She went in and it's like I didn't realize we're buying a car that day. Then we were, but um, it's a different story. But um, but then the, the 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 electric car then was my thing, and then of course she just took it and I'm driving that car that she didn't want anymore. So. That's there awesome. You go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, I think that's, a good, that's a good point. I like I met uh, I, in an EV, the air conditioning comes on so quickly um, and the performance for the price is so much better than like a comparable internal combustion engine car. Um, yeah, it's like you, you, you get used to it. Yeah. 
and, and I would say I would to... add to uh, like, I mean, the, the, the leaf, I mean, the, I think the other thing is like the range is different, but the driving feeling is actually very similar. Like, you know, I mean, maybe the, 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 the Tesla's got the ludicrous mode and whatnot, but I think all of them really have the same sort of feel or zippy, you know, like, so it, it becomes less like different across models, really. You're just really paying for, for really for range and for some, really for range, I think, is really what it differentiates in some, in some creature comforts. But, you know, um, it's still, I mean, 10 grand, it drives, drives like a dream, right? It's just, it doesn't drive as far for 10 grand. And if you spend more and get a Bolt or get a Nero or something with more battery power, battery range, right? Right. Well, everyone does see there. There is this uh, conception out there that EVs are are still the slow, small, dinky. Abed, yours is technically five years old, but <laughs> like yeah. that they're just these all little tiny cars. It's like no, there are so many more models out there. Um, and you know, as we're seeing more and more of these models, we're actually starting to see a used market. And I don't think anybody on this call has bought a used EV. Um, but we do have a coworker who did, uh, and he got it off of Carvana and he got his, Matt might actually be on this call. Um, he, you know, it got delivered to his house. It's a 2016 used e-golf and he got to test drive it and he loved the experience. Um, and has recommended it so much that it's actually the model that I think I'm going to go with. So there are definitely, you know, used EVs out there, um, and even in COVID times, you know, we can online shop for everything nowadays. So uh, for folks who have had their car for longer, so I think Brad and Abed, this one would go to you guys. Um, I don't think either of you had have had to replace your batteries or have had any issues like that. Yeah, that's, we have a question here about, you know, how, how much does it uh, cost to replace your batteries? Is that something you expect um, or should expect as an EV owner? Uh, what we kind of say at Gen 180 is if you have to replace the battery in your EV, that's like replacing the engine in your car. Um, something has gone terribly awry and you should not expect that. Uh, but even, God forbid, that were to happen, most uh, EVs now have an eight year, 100,000 mile warranty on their batteries. So was that ever something you guys were concerned about? Um. Yeah, sure. I mean, so the thing that I, I'll, I'll give you two things. One is um, on the Prius, I did replace the battery. You know, so I, I've done that before. Um, and, and that there's a pretty good aftermarket for that. That's a hybrid. So we're not talking about that. But, um, but that's definitely doable. It's been done. I've seen it done. So I know that can be done. And on the Leaf, um, Nissan, I have to go back and look. I think they announced something like maybe like five or six thousand dollars i think as the replacement cost for the leaf i don't know anybody who's done it i haven't done it myself i haven't needed to yet and um and so here's what i would say on it is that you know your battery life your battery won't die right but people will lose range over time i've seen that with with leaf so you know when you're buying the car if it's a used car you can get a battery report and it'll you know, give you the, what's the just inspection report on the battery. So you'll know what you're buying. And I, I did that with, when I was considering used, but, um, but we bought a new one. And, you know, if you have a car with 200 miles of range and you lose say 10% range, okay, that's still like, I would still kill for that range. I mean, it's great, you know, like whatever. It's like, it's <laughs> double my range. So on the leaf, I just you have to be just, cognizant of just like what's your driving distance that you're doing and it's like it will reduce the range of the car but is it still within the, the viable range and it's I think we're still viable at like you know 60 miles of range really for what we've got right and so you know you'll have it's not a cliff it's sort of a, a slope I guess right if something mm -hmm. goes wrong it's really going to be more degradation than failure and and then how does that relate to what your actual needs are so if you need, you know, bigger, bigger range means more buffer. That's how I'd look at it. You know, warranty well, was actually one of the factors in, in my picking that car because uh, hmm. Kia has pretty good warranties. The regular warranty around, you know, things 
around the car, not just the electric powertrain, is 10 years. And the battery and the electric powertrain warranty is, uh, I'm sorry, the other warranty is five years, but the battery and the powertrain warranty is 10 years or 100,000 miles. Yeah, and I think those warranties are all transferable, meaning to the second mm -hmm. owner in a, in a uh, pre-owned condition. It may be. Yeah, uh, as, as Abed said, it's a, it's a, the battery warranty is that it, it is, remains above a certain percentage of its original capacity, like 70 or 80 percent. If it falls below that, then it would be a warranty job, but that almost like never happens. Anybody have anything else to add or can we move on to the next one? I would add one thing, which is, I think if we think over the next five years, seven, eight, 10 years, right? If you're buying one of these, that's kind of your time frame. is there will probably be a market for, you know, used batteries for like other things, right? Like energy storage for, you know, for oh, home, there is now. home solar. There is yeah. now. So I think just thinking ahead, right? This is a big trend that's happening is that companies like Nissan, you know, part of what they would want to do with those, those leaf batteries will be a huge number of them, right? is you know there is a market for that because you don't need to drive your solar storage battery from your home it doesn't need to move right so it's still super viable even if it's not as if it's not viable in a car right so i think i think there's there's a path for these i just think it's being mm -hmm. defined as we speak so yeah i mean people would be surprised to learn that there are data centers all over the country currently being powered by recycled EV batteries. Um, there you go. When the battery's done in your car, it still has about 70% of its life left. And there That's are it. so many second life applications all over the globe um, that you know we're only beginning to scratch the surface of how we can reuse these things. Yeah. Here's a really interesting question from the, um, from the attendees. Now, given the fact that you guys are even participating in this Ask a EV Owner event, it, it already helps answer some of the question, but has owning an EV somehow made you uh, more active or more aware on topics of clean energy and um, things like that? Um, do you find other changes in your lifestyle uh, as a result of being an EV owner have, you know, like we just talked about, once you uh, are looking for a, a charger, you see them everywhere. And sometimes that's the way it happens. Like once your eyes are opened a little bit, they open even wider. Do you guys have any examples or stories of how owning an EV has, has changed your lifestyle? Brad, do you want to start? Um, sure. Yeah. So I, I'm definitely involved um, with this. I love getting the, the emails that are like, Oh, the state needs feedback on why we we should. Uh, uh, I, what, what was it? The the um, charging infrastructure, like um, why we should um, why we should prepare our Virginia's electrical grid for greater EV adoption and encourage off-peak charging. Thank you, everyone who submitted your comments. You are my favorite. Um, and and I think. In my opinion, one of the the major hurdles is this is this range and perception about how far you can go, and so I'm always on the lookout for uh, new chargers being installed, new initiatives to add new chargers because the more I can talk to people and be like, "There's a charger 30 miles in every single direction," you know that kind of thing, like that that takes away like the biggest like, "Well, I don't know," kind of um, you know, limitation. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm definitely uh, interested uh, and this, I guess, as far as kind of the, the lifestyle, I, I, yeah, I guess now that you asked the question, um, like I've definitely gotten quotes for solar uh, on my house. Um, you know, I, I'm more conscious about the effect that things have and the consumption of different activities. Absolutely. Okay. Miriam, you want to take a shot at this one? Absolutely. I think, um, as a family, we try to become more conscious of our carbon footprint and then also think about, I, I mentioned this earlier, we um, wanting to be in a walkable neighborhood where I can, I only really charge my car once or twice in two weeks, maybe at the max because I, you know, I'm walking to things and then just how we're making decisions to be better, you know, 
inhabitants of the environment. Like how are we, what are we doing with this earth? Because this is for generations to come. And what do our decisions make? So I have those conversations with my teenagers. I had them early on um, with them as well. But this is, you know, a thing that we think about all the time. So I don't need to go to the dry clean, drive to the dry cleaners, we walk or the, um, the, you know, the patisserie or the, like, uh, the butcher. We can walk to all those things and come back and run our errands or go to the grocery. So it's... To ride a bike. You know, there, there's electric bikes out there. Yeah. And they're pretty awesome. Walking's better. <laughs> That's true. For calories. There's my son in the background. Oh, uh, true. David, David, what about you? Has it has owning an EV somehow changed your perspective on things? Um, yeah, to some extent, it's probably not as dramatic. Uh, I'm not as young, so I'm probably less flexible <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> That's very honest. But, but um, you know, seeing people complain on Facebook about. Coke's use of single-use plastic bottles, for example. Yeah, I get more excited about that than I would have in the past. Uh, we bought, you know, these mesh bags to get put produce in at the store instead of using awesome. the plastic bags. Uh, you know, use our own shopping bags. It's harder to do now with COVID, but we still try to do that. Um, yeah, so there's a general, you know, and thinking about my kids, they're grown, but you know, when they have kids someday, what, what is that going to do? What, what shape is the world going to be in? And I, I do care about that. Yeah, yeah. Abed, how about you? Has it, owning EV somehow changed your, um, your outlook and your actions? I think, I mean, I think I probably already came into it. Um, you know, I, like I said, I bought a Prius in 2000. I worked for a solar company. So, I mean, I don't think it changed that trajectory at all. Um, he was already guess, bought in is what he's saying. I, I was bought in. I mean, um, but what I would, you know, one thing I would say is um, I've noticed because, you know, sometimes when you're driving and you're trying to get from point A to point B and you're just like, well, okay, do I need to stop and charge or not? Or what can I do? You know, you, you, <laughs> we're kind of irrational about how we drive in a sense too, because we just want to drive fast. And it's like, you don't really save a lot of time going 80 miles an hour. I mean, you might think you are, but you're really not. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, when you dial back the speed, uh, you significantly, you know, you go, get, go significantly more range. I mean, it's not even close. Okay. Um, just air resistance and stuff. So, you know, I mean, dr casually driving, but if you're like on a road trip and you just sort of chill out and dial it back and just cruise, I mean... It's like five minutes or something versus stopping and charging and like so i've done that calculation and and yeah i don't know great okay yeah all right it's not well, earth changing it's just no, no, pedantic no, <laughs> no but i mean ever since i you know started working on electric vehicles i now see them every like i see them everywhere and i frequently tell my my coworkers that i have to stop myself from following someone in an ev that i don't know to be like oh, you have an ev and it's a new i've probably done this to you david because there's only so many kia neros uh in virginia let alone charlottesville and been like oh that's a new one in town and had to fight the urge to not, you know, follow you into the shopping market and say, hi, I'm Blair. Uh, that's probably going to get me in trouble one day. Yeah. But, you know, I think you all have brought up really good points too, is like it, it shows your daily life in a different way as well. And, you know, there are lots of different ways that we can, you know, factor these decisions in into everything that we do. Um, and EVs play a role in everything we do. And uh, to that question, you know, we've got a question here that says, do you just use your cars for mainly getting around the local area or do you take them on long trips? You know, we know a lot of you have actually done some pretty long trips, but it sounds like as well that EVs are just a fantastic daily driver. Um, and we got a question saying, are there EVs that I can fit two kids and my groceries in? Um, yeah. Are there any cars you them. guys drive that can't do that? <laughs> no. All no, they're not all little tiny smart cars. No, they're... We have smart cars, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you look really hard, you could find a terribly small one that nobody wants. But like, I think there's like the Mitsubishi My EV is the only really 
golf carty kind of one out there. I mean, everything else is a, like a normal car. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love that email. Um, and I so appreciated it because I absolutely <laughs> agree that a lot of, you know, that is, that is definitely the perception that they're tiny and small and can't get you around. But I mean, Miriam, I think yours is biggest out of the four here. I think the X is technically bigger than the Nero, oh, yeah. but all of you I'm sure can fit several bags of groceries and, you know, rioting children in the back seat as well. I sympathize. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have two kids. I've got, you know, I've got two kids and we've we've got two kids, two car seats, and a mother-in-law in the back. So it's, you know, fine. Do you, you not like your mother-in-law? I... <laughs> well, I mean, we want her to come with us, so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so there you go, I mean. We're, we better get off this topic very yeah. quickly for Abid's sake. A very thin point there, Abid. <laughs> Hey, sp speaking of, you know, that, that's a common misperception, these cars being small or, or slow. Um, another question we got and we hear often is, how are these cars, how are electric cars in the cold and the snow and the rain? Does it, is it just like any other car or if somehow you have to change um, the way you deal with, with cold weather or snow? Can you give us some insight there? Uh, mine is front wheel drive. And, uh, and, you know, so the, the motor and most of the electronics are in the front. So most of that weighs in the front. Uh, but a lot of the weight is distributed along the length of the car down low. And my car is actually heavier than the Subaru Forester I used to drive. And so even though it's still pretty nimble and quick, as we've been talking about, and that kind of weight, I think, does you well in the snow to an extent in terms of pushing down mm -hmm. through the snow to the pavement. And so in that respect, I think they're somewhat advantageous. Have I had to drive up my steep driveway in the snow yet? Not yet. So I haven't had to really test that out. But one thing I realized is that when you're at a stop and you start pressing on the accelerator, that instant torque is right there. So it's not like you have to overshoot with the gas pedal in yeah. an ice car. To, to get up to speed. I mean, you're getting that torque right from the get-go and that's going to give you so much more control in that situation. Brad, you've, you've been to Michigan, so I feel like it's cold there, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, my car is General Motors. They're based in Michigan. It, it's, it's just like any other car. Um, now, I, I mean, I will say that lithium-ion batteries do not perform as well in the cold, so... Mm -hmm. Uh, with decreased temperatures does come decreased range. Um, somewhere in the 30 to 40 mile range, like uh, basically reduced maximum range that I get in my car. Yeah, I think um, it's 30 percent. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that matters. Um, so yeah, something to be aware of. But as far as like a like a day to day in town, yeah, no difference. Anybody else done, you know, taking their EV, doing wheelies in the snow? No wheelies. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I, I saw a guy, I mean, when I was skiing this year before COVID, I mean, I was in the parking lot and I took the gas car. Uh, but uh, there's a guy in a bolt, you know, it's like 90 miles away from here, up a steep, you know, steep mountain pass. Um, and, uh, you know, people. Drove the bolt up, front wheel drive. I don't know if he had snow tires or not, but you know, snow like, tires make all the difference. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe he did. Maybe he did change. I don't remember what he what I had on there, but like, yeah, legit guy in a bolt, you know, up at the ski hill. So that's yeah. that's a pretty pretty solid deal. And and even uh, electric vehicles with rear wheel drive, because the batteries are low to the ground, mm. electric vehicles tend to have a lower center of gravity, so they perform really well in uh, in adverse conditions. Yeah, yeah, could be, yeah. Mark Lady Snyder just put uh, in the, oh gosh, she's adding to it, making it go away, um, in the chat that, yeah, EVs have heavy batteries, so they are good in the snow. Um, and I'm a, 
I'm a sucker for t putting a car through its limits. So if it does snow anytime soon in Virginia, I will absolutely have fun with my EV and uh, see what I see what trouble I can get into. You know, I would add to I don't know if anybody else but like the regenerative braking. I think if you're going down a snowy slope and stuff and it it gives you that it's like if you have to brake hard in snow, right, you're going to skid and I think it gives you a, a little bit I haven't driven this the leaf much in once in snow, but I'd always use the regenerative braking and just put it all the way and it definitely helps you to slow down coming down something steep. Actually, that brings up a really good point. Um, does anybody, and Abed, if you want to start, uh, want to discuss or just tell our audience what regenerative braking is? Yeah, yeah. So basically what happens is when you're, you're, uh, you're rolling down a hill or you're decelerating, uh, instead of the, the car just coasting, the, as the wheels turn, it actually charges the battery. And that creates drag on the wheels, so it causes the car to slow down. But while it's slowing down, it's actually recharging the battery. So you kind of get two for one. It's like instead of having the low gears on your gas car, like you know, second gear, first gear, you would instead just have the batteries have this regenerative braking slow the car down. And you know, you it's more efficient that way because you get more range, but it also is a way to slow the car down. Mm -hmm. We have a coworker who on the two weeks into owning her Tesla went on a, on a journey and went up the mountain and lost some, you know, drained the battery a little bit going up the mountain, just like you, you know, use more gas as you're trying to go up a hill in your gas car. And she said when they went back down the mountain because of the regenerative braking, she made up a considerable amount of that range. Oh, yeah. She was like, oh, oh yeah. cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, lots of fun, new, exciting things to experience when you're a e new EV owner, too, that, you know, you're, you're learning. Mm -hmm. And then someone in the chat just said, you know, the brakes get less wear, the physical brakes get less wear, and that is, that is definitely true. Like, because you don't, you don't need to brake lightly at all to slow down. You just let the regenerative braking do the work. And I think that's generally, um, you know, one of the real benefits everyone talks about electric vehicles is this lower cost of ownership, you know, in addition to not doing gas and not doing oil change. Yeah. Uh, you don't have as many moving parts, you have less wear on brake pads, for example. Right. Uh, one of the selling points to me on my car was that the regenerative braking is adjustable on four levels, zero, one, two, and three. And so you can adjust it with paddles on the steering wheel as to how much regenerative braking you want. And there's this fight among people about whether they're gliders or regenerators. <laughs> uh, but my car has the additional feature that it uses the radar that's used for the cruise control that, to sense cars in front of me. So it has auto regeneration. So I can set a baseline level of regeneration. And then as I'm approaching cars that are stopped at a light or a stop sign, the car will sense that and start increasing the regenerative braking to the point that it slows down to like six miles an hour. And then I can use the, the rest of the brakes for the rest of the way, which I really, really like. And yeah, and, and one, one other note on this topic, um, because all you have to do to engage regenerative braking is let your foot off the accelerator. If like something happens and like, oh no, the car in front of you is stopping. The second you start, bringing your foot off the accelerator, the car is slowing down pretty aggressively. And so the, all of that time when your foot's moving to the other pedal, you're actually slowing down, um, which is just like that little bit more, you know, that, that more feet, which could make a difference. It, it, it is kind of a nice byproduct of that mm -hmm. you know, from a safety perspective. Yeah. And you've yeah, got two sure. things slowing the car down. I mean, you've got the regenerative braking and the physical braking. So you've got like two brakes, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, overall, we see safety uh, features on EVs and safety ratings on EVs scoring higher and higher um, and considerably above ICE vehicles uh, and to the point about the weight and the weight being more evenly distributed. They flip less because of it. Um, so smoother, safer, can still handle in snow and put your kids in with tons of groceries. I mean, I'm not hearing any bad points, uh, but to that, you know, we only have five minutes left with you guys and we do want to let you get back to the rest of your lives. Um, and so one question that popped up is, 
what do we need to do to get more people into electric vehicles? What do we need to do to speed up the adoption rates of electric vehicles? Uh, so I'd love all of your takes on it. Um, and Brad, I think I'll start with you, but it can be, you know, is it policy? Is it more advocacy? Is it more things like this? You know, what are, and what are those myths that we need to do some more busting on to help people, to help speed up the adoption rates of EVs? Yeah, definitely. The, the just getting those misconceptions out of the way, um, events like this, I think are, are super important for that. Um, like I said before, I think just being able to have that confidence that, I mean, even though people don't drive very far, everyone thinks that they need a lot of range, um, that confidence that, well, there's going to be a charger anywhere you want to go as that continues to grow. I think that will really help. Um, uh, and I think another, and this is just going to take some time, is, is to continue to increase the, the type and the number of models. Um, I mean, like a, like a pickup truck has been on the horizon forever now. So when that finally, that hurdle gets met, that's a huge car market um, where there's now, there, there would be an EV option. And, and so just, just having sort of more choice, um, that's going to take time, but uh, that will, I think will help as well. Miriam, do you want to go next? I think talking about it, making it real, making it a real attainable thing. Um, and then I've mentioned to people, they're like, oh, well, electric cars, you have a Tesla, so you have to have a lot of money to have an electric car. And that's, that's a misconception. Yeah, Teslas are expensive, but there's other EVs that are affordable, like you were all talking about. Um, there's other EV cars out there, and there's charging stations out there. So it's not just a one-size-fits-all within your budget. It can be within your budget, and it's attainable. So talking about that experience and talking about other people you know that drive EVs, like you and I had a conversation, Blair. So it's just people think that it's not something they can do. I think Europe is probably a good example. Uh, their carbon caps are very strict and very enforced to the point that manufacturers are focusing on Europe as a market for electric cars more so, which is one reason my car is less seemingly available here in the U.S. I had to go up to Maryland to buy that because it's not sold in Virginia. Yes, um, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, that's, they need to be more universally accessible, which, you know, gets into supply chain issues and battery production and all that, but that's, you know, that's just growing and improving all the time. Now there's thunder here. <laughs> it's left me, it's coming your way. <laughs> Abed, you want to round us out? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably three things. I mean, I think, you know, one of them is, I think price does matter. I think the EV tax credit, I think, could have, should have been just till we get to a certain number of EV adoption. I think doing my brand makes absolutely no sense to me. I don't know why they do that, but they do. Um, so Tesla, you can't get a $7,500 tax credit on a Model 3. Why not? I don't get it. Um, that matters. Um, I think the charging network helps, right? So that you have the perception on the range thing go away and then just more people with them, then it becomes less of a, of a question. If you know people that have one, then, you know, you're going to feel comfortable. Right. Um, so I think this type of thing helps too. Yeah. Um, you know, we've reached our time. I want to, I want to thank everyone, um, all the EV owners for, taking their Thursday night and uh, telling everyone about their experience. And also thank you to everyone who uh, dialed in to, to ask yeah. great questions. Uh, this will be posted on the Generation 180 uh, YouTube channel. So if you missed some of the beginning where we talked about long distance road trips or what family and friends members, uh, family and f uh, friends seem to think about uh, transitioning to EVs, uh, some great, uh, great stories at the beginning of the broadcast. So check us out. And um, also a reminder, sign the pledge. So thanks everyone and have a really good evening. Awesome, thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Be safe. Bye. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having us. Sure, thanks Bye, for- folks. Bye.